Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting Harvesting Happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show where we will be exploring cultivating dignity and selfhood for the deeply forgetful. My guest today is Dr. Stephen G. Post. He is the founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook University Renaissance School of Medicine, where he also serves as professor of family, population, and preventative medicine. Post has also taught at the University of Chicago Medical School, Case Western Reserve University of Medicine, He is an elected member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of Alzheimer's Disease International and a widely respected opinion leader, speaker, and best-selling author. And Dr. Post is in the house to talk about dignity for deeply forgetful people, how caregivers can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Stephen G. Post, thanks for being with me today. Hi, Lisa. It's a delight. I'm enjoying it already. Me too. I mean, you and I had a great conversation leading into this conversation, and we share uh, a love and reverence and lots of good memories about the birth of positive psychology. So that's a good starting point. It is. You know my situation, and I'm not in, in that situation alone because you wouldn't be doing what you're doing without a vast need for educating the public on how to support our elders as they progress through their lives and give them a sense of dignity and care and love. Uh, Well, absolutely. And the title of this book, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, to me, it's it's a great beginning point because I actually have been uncomfortable with the word dementia since it's such a negative concept, it's a decline from a former mental state. But deeply forgetful people, you know, it's much more inclusive, much more open, much more tolerant. Um, You know, hope is being open to surprises, to those moments of surprising lucidity that uh, you don't expect necessarily, but that make a caregiver realize that, in fact, grandma is still there. Yes. And when those moments arise, and I have witnessed it myself, um, they are pretty spectacular. You know, you think that, um, you know, there is no memory, there's no cognition, and then suddenly they're all there with their stories and their bells and their whistles and their presence and their light, and you go, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's so surprising, and and yet that's so true. And And so I had actually coined a term called paradoxical lucidity way, way back in the 1990s to describe this because it is paradoxical. Someone, their their head's down, they're not communicating, uh, or if they are at all, it's chaotic. And then they'll have this moment of lucidity. And so I would ask myself, where is this coming from? And I came to the conclusion I'd done assisted oral feeding, by the way, for my grandmother. Who So my grandmother uh, had Alzheimer's disease before they really even used the term, the A word. Uh, it was senile dementia. But when I was doing assisted oral feeding with her uh, in my early 20s, I always sensed that there was a mystery. There was more there than meets the eye. And I could never buy into the negative metaphors oh, she's a husk, she's gone, she's absent, she's not there. I had to be more hospitable than that and open-minded. And that's why I got so interested in these moments of 
relative lucidity where she might, in fact, surprisingly remember my name, uh, and I would feel her emotional presence. And, and so she was never not there. She was always there underneath the surface, opaque, but there. There are questions that caregivers ask, you know, of the medical profession, of our doctors, about our loved ones, you know, like what's going on? How long will this last? I mean, what, what, are, what are the questions that, that you hear from people? Well, I spent about 20 solid years traveling around the U.S. and responding to uh, caregivers. I think all the chapters of the Alzheimer's Association from east to west and up in Canada and in Japan and Australia and India and so forth. But they ask a lot of practical questions. Um, uh, how should we break the news to grandma as if grandma might not already suspect? <laughs> um, you know, they ask things, how quickly will I decline? And of course, the bottom line is you've seen one case, you've seen one case. And I think it's quite important to realize this is not simply genetically determined stage one, two, three, four in certain windows of time, because how we interact with these individuals can actually very much affect the course of the illness. Are there effective drugs? Will I be there more or less despite the confusion and the silence? Will I suffer? Uh, should I continue to treat my heart failure or diabetes or dialysis as this unfolds? This is a good one. Do I abandon the care for the other conditions? That's a big one. It is a big one. And, you know, in this book, I argue essentially that that's a legitimate question to ask. And it's perfectly legitimate to decide that you don't want to continue these uh, other treatments. Uh, and I have lots of cases of that and why I think it's worked out reasonably well. But it can be very difficult for people because they do feel maybe that they're abandoning their loved one. Um, is genetic testing a good idea? Uh, should I have a living will or a durable power of attorney? Yes. Will, will, <laughs> right? will, oh, yeah. Will my, will my remaining ability to make choices be respected? Will I be physically or chemically restrained? Can I drive? Research? How can I die in a way that I don't have a tube in every orifice, natural and unnatural? And even about assisted suicide, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've actually – I'm not a proponent of what I call preemptive assisted suicide, but uh, having spent 20 years in Ohio, uh, I knew a number of people with very early onset dementia who went to, to the neurologist and they asked if they could get their 40 secanols and whatever. And um, with, with great hesitation, the neurologist would actually make that prescription, but didn't want to be any place on in the vicinity. Mm. And so just even though I didn't necessarily agree with all this, I nevertheless, in a more pastoral way, was present at several of these events with families along the shores of Lake Erie with the, you know, the fire burning and, and, and uh, none of the grandchildren around, thank God, but the adult children and maybe siblings. And somebody would uh, simply uh, present the, the milkshake with, with the Seconals and, wow. and uh, ground up and, and Bach would be playing, uh, uh, you know, or maybe Vivaldi and, uh, it was all pretty peaceful. Uh, and now, of course, you know, uh, I wrote an article recently uh, with the people from UCSF, uh, University of California, San Francisco, about a fellow who was a street clown in San Francisco. He had no family. So now it's not a nice term, but in the Alzheimer's world, these people are referred to as live alones. And what does he do? He wants to go to uh, Switzerland to Dignitas and uh, – uh, allow them for a fee to uh, to perform euthanasia. And he actually did that. And, and, and this happens now without uh, 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 too much hesitation. People can go to Canada, to Quebec, to yes. Montreal. And so I think that we have to discuss this at some point uh, because I mean, in Oregon and many states in the U.S. now, about eight or nine of them, you can have so-called uh, – physician-assisted suicide, but you've still got to be lucid of mind six months before two physicians uh, acting independently say you're going to die. Well, for someone with a progressive dementia, 
you know, you, but when you get to that point of six months before death, you were you lost your lucidity a long time ago. So that's the question that people are now uh, confronting. Should we should we make this an option in Oregon? ALS patients, as well as cancer patients, avail themselves of of assisted suicide because if you have ALS, people can say, well, you're probably going to die in two or three months if we don't keep up with the intubation. <sighs> and, 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 and so ALS patients have access, but not people with, say, Parkinson's or people with Alzheimer's or other forms of, of dementia, which remove their lucidity much earlier than, than, uh, than, uh, the, than usually the case. And how do we help caregivers understand that their loved one's wishes really need to be respected? Because oftentimes you, ha you might have caregivers that have a fundamental philosophical difference about what should be done. Yes, this is very, very challenging, especially when the caregiver is an adult child. There are, Lisa, many, many studies uh, in the gerontology literature um, about the difference in choices made by um, spouses and adult children. The spouses tend to get in the groove of looking at life. You know, we've been there, done that. We've had a good run. Um, and they're more willing to say, hey, let's not use a feeding pig, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy and so forth. <sighs> let's just do assisted oral feeding and let let grandma or grandpa, uh, uh, my husband, my wife, let them let them pass. But the, the adult children you know, all their lives. This is attachment theory 101. You're a psychologist. <laughs> yes. you know, they get on the <laughs> They're not ready to let them go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, adult children are attached to their parents, which is perfectly natural and normal and good. Uh, and so I've seen cases where, uh, for example, uh, a, an older woman had determined that her husband uh, would not have a feeding pig placed. And he did pass away very comfortably in a hospice environment. Now, she had two grandchildren by her daughter, who was in her mid-40s, and that daughter was so irate about not giving grandpa or her father uh, the latest technology, which would have been a feeding pig or some such thing, uh, that she had not let the mother visit the grandchildren for three years. Wow. It can go very, very deep. These kinds of resentments within family dynamics are profound. And, you know, it's interesting. I was at Case Western for 20 years, and um, the first year I was there was 1988, and a wonderful uh, pediatric surgeon by the name of Dr. Michael Gowderer invented the feeding pig because you couldn't sustain children for long periods of time with tubes down their throats. The right. tubes disintegrate, and, and they're very challenging to manage. And so he figured out a way to do this feeding pig where you have a little white rubber tube that goes into the belly and it's not intrusive terribly much and uh, it, it can be left there for very long periods of time without having to be changed. But the trouble is that uh, in 1985, for the first time in history, a feeding pig was used on somebody with advanced dementia in a nursing home in Illinois. And then for about five or 10 years, it became the craze. Nursing homes were firing the people who were good at assisted oral feeding, which takes a little bit of an art form, incidentally, as you can probably imagine. And uh, it wasn't until maybe 2000 that four or five people, myself included, began writing articles in the American Journal of Medicine and so forth about how maybe we should really not be using feeding pigs. And Michael Gatterer himself, who's now at the University of South Carolina Medical School, wrote a powerful editorial in the American Journal of Percutaneous Endoscopic Gastrostomy. Don't try to repeat that. No, <laughs> and, and, I won't, and, don't worry. <laughs> and, and, and he just condemned the use of feeding pigs in people in, in end-stage Alzheimer's. He thought it was completely inappropriate. He had, he had invented this for young kids with feeding difficulties, with uh, throat blockages, and 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 it, this was simply not in his vision 
of how this would be applied. And in Canada, they never use, nobody uses feeding pigs in Canada. It doesn't happen. It's all assisted oral feeding. And then when your system shuts down, um, then you die comfortably. And the brain kicks in with natural palliative chemicals, endorphins, and you're okay. And you can be palliated if you need it. There's a lot of good palliative care now. Yeah. Um, so, so those kinds of issues are big issues, but people feel so guilty because, hey, you know, this is food and water and all the metaphors come cranking in, you know, shared humanity, common humanity. I'll tell you, you know, I could give you a thousand cases where I work to convince people um, as, a, as a consultant that they really did not, did not need to feel badly or guilty about deciding just to let nature take its course. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. And that is a guarantee. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And at times, we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back continuing the exploration of cultivating dignity and selfhood for the deeply forgetful. Let's get back to the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Stephen G. Post. And I think that this is the dilemma that many caregivers have, you know, the, the idea that we want to prolong life or at least prolong some quality of life. And then when you get to that place where the quality is no longer there and then allowing nature to take its course and making your loved one feel comfortable, respected, safe, and also alleviating your own moral questions about what you're doing or not doing. Very much so. And, and you know, um, people with advanced dementia, they have no insight into what that little white tube is that's coming out of their belly and it's usually taped down with a bandage of some kind. So they'll pull it out. That's the major reason why even today people with uh, advanced Alzheimer's are actually um, uh, tied down because be, because the you know the idea is in the nursing home we don't want them pulling that out and so then they're tied down they're strapped they're typically you know sitting in urine and so forth and uh, and they get infections and it's, so if you look at the mortality studies. Uh, which I've actually done, you know, uh, people live longer with assisted oral feeding than they do with a feeding pig. <sighs> so, so you give them applesauce, you give them a little bran, you give them, you know, there, there are cookbooks uh, for this, if you will, uh, uh, but simple things, and, and they will actually do better. Uh, also, one of the major reasons for aspiration pneumonia is that they're coughing up this artificial nutriment and it gets into their uh, esophagus. So you avoid that problem. So there's no, there's no positive to assisted to, to feeding pigs. Let's talk about the ethical purpose of a caregiver, because I, this is a very interesting point to me. You know, when somebody takes on the role of the caregiver, I'm going to speak for myself that I, probably didn't look at all of the angles and the huge responsibility that that brings. What is the role of the caregiver? It's more than just, you know, bringing, bringing meals and changing sheets. It is. I have always felt that the most important thing for a caregiver is to be a noticer. That's a term from Larry Dossie, to be a noticer. You want to be stimulating that continuing personal identity that is always there and that underlies these moments of paradoxical lucidity. Yeah. And you can do that with personalized music. You know, Dan Cohen, who, who founded Music and Memory, lives about 20 miles away from me in Mineola, Long Island. Oh, really? And we, yeah, we've written papers together. And when I first got here from Ohio, we got together before he even uh, made that great um, movie, Alive Inside, 
So I'm a big fan of Dan's and we get him over here occasionally to talk to the students. And, you know, um, what, what's astonishing is that, again, you know, so many people have this incredibly negative stereotype of people who have dementia. That's why I don't, as I said, again, I don't like the term dementia. It is so negative. It invites negative metaphors and negative analogies. And, and so I go with dignity for deeply forgetful people. And I, I believe love it. <laughs> because, you know, I, I have my moments. I have to tell you, Lisa, you know, about a year ago, I was out in the parking lot behind the Stony Brook Medical School and I couldn't remember where I parked my car. And shockingly enough, I'd had such a long day. I wasn't even certain that I'd driven to work. Oh, no. <laughs> which is not a good sign. And, and, and so I, I asked a medical student, um, do you know where my car is? And she had no idea. Of course, she laughed. You know, I, I laughed. I eventually found my car. But, you know, we all have these moments. I mean, in a, in a big institution like this with hundreds and hundreds of students, I can't remember all of their names all of the time. So I have to sort of, you know, finesse it, if you will. And I think that we have to realize that 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 their exp- the experience of people who are deeply forgetful, it's more uh, continuous in that state, but it's no categorically different experience than we all have when we just blank out. The deeply forgetful term, I really I I love it and I, I appreciate it, and I'm I'm living in that environment every day, and I it does change one's view towards towards the loved one you know that deeply forgetful yep like we go back to the same the same conversations you know a hundred times a day you know the day usually begins and ends with you know all i really want is a dog oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> who's so gonna was, walk that the, dog oh yeah dogs are important in this area so so i was actually on the board of the um uh, uh, Alzheimer's Association in Scotland when they first introduced the idea, this is like 25 years ago, of the Alzheimer's companion dog. And these are trained, uh, uh, typically Labradors, because they're so well-mannered. And then it spread to Australia. So get this, here's a story for you. About 10 years ago, I was doing a talk on deeply forgetful people for the Australian Alzheimer's Association in Sydney. And they had about 50 individuals with their wonderful, beautiful, loving Alzheimer's dogs. And they walked down the main drag in Sydney, you know, down toward the opera house. And and everybody was kind of doing a double take. And this taxi driver, he drove up to me because I was kind of leading the way. And he said, blimey, dogs are for blind people. (laughs) And I said... (laughs) <laughs> they can do a lot of good for a lot of folks. But, you know, I think that's that, that I've, there are so, you, you know, these stories about people who, who really connect with, with, with a dog and the dog doesn't give a damn if your m- memory is somewhat imperiled or, or not. Uh, I mean, they're there for you. They're loyal. I mean, C.S. Lewis put dogs in heaven. I don't blame him. I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> I, I hear it every day about if I just had a dog, everything would be perfect. But I but I go back to like, who cares for that dog? Like who actually walks and feeds that dog? You know, there's a that's, well, that's the disconnect. <laughs> that's the cognitive dissonance of the equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that is that is. And so, you know, it, it's re- it really works very, very well when somebody already has a dog and, and, and then they become. Surrogate, the surrogate dog. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That works very well. Now, you know, bringing one in uh, is is a little more complicated, admittedly, but there's a whole website in Australia on how to navigate uh, the, 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 the valuable use of dogs. And it's not always uh, as, as valuable as you might hope, but look, I mean, it's an interesting model music, dogs, you know, Alzheimer's poetry in, in Brooklyn, there's an Alzheimer's, well, actually there's a, memory center there and its whole focus is poetry so they have three or four full-time alzheimer's poets and i i was on the board of that organization and they they'll they'll bring in they might have 20 or 30 people who are deeply forgetful gathered around in a big room and they're not conversant they're really not observing one another and then this guy would with a lot of energy he would say the road not taken. And then he would start talking. <laughs> Word slam. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and all these people, because of their generation, they, they know the lines of that poem. And, and most of them would chime in and some of them would get rhythmic. And then afterwards, at least for a period of time, maybe just four or five minutes, they would actually have um, simple but nevertheless significant um, verbal interaction. And so with music, with poetry, uh, this Pets. is why the music and memory thing is so important. Um, you, you, you know, you, 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 our job as caregivers is to bring people back into themselves if we can. Really good point. I mean, that, that is something that we often overlook with the, the, the chore part of the caregiving, you know, the physical parts that go into the care and keeping of an, of another beating heart. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, I, I'm all, you know, I've taught in medical schools for 35 years, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Chicago case for 20 years and, and I love medical students and I love medical science. But when you really look at it, uh, outside of some of the behavioral medications, especially in the moderate stage of the disease, because those problems with aggression and so forth uh, dissipate on their own as this advances. But I just have to say that the medical model is quite, um, quite limited. Uh, you know, if you could, on a scale of one to 10, and I won't mention anything specific, but if you could take the best drug that we have now for Alzheimer's, um, it would probably, if, if 10 is a, is, is a great drug, like insulin for Alzheimer's disease, yeah. okay, it's insulin for diabetes. I would say that we're sort of at a, maybe a 0.05. I mean, yeah. my, my colleague at Case Western for many years, Peter Whitehouse, he had the patent with the company that made one of the more popular drugs. He, the cholinergic uh, hypothesis is something that he came up with. Uh, but you know, um, uh, uh, when we did those original studies and I was, I was involved in those to some degree, all we found was that, you know, if a person, if you gave, if you put a cup of, of water on the table, instead of having one sip and then wandering off and forgetting about it, they might have two or 1.5 sips on average. They, you know, instead of um, forgetting all the names of the grandchildren when they made a phone call to California, um, they would might remember one or two names. And then that, even that benefit would dissipate. And as Peter himself said, you know, it's it, what we're really doing, it's, it's like treating um, a brain tumor with aspirin. Neurologists prescribe aspirin, and it can have some benefits for certain symptoms, but it doesn't have an impact on the underlying condition. Yeah. However, how we how we interact with these people does. Yes. This is why you know Gayatri Devi, who's in, who's my good friend in, in in New York. You know, she's really into uh, epigenetics and neuroplasticity. She's fabulous. We've had her on the show. Yeah. She's wonderful. She's right. I have her here to speak with our students. And, lifestyle, and, and, right? Yeah, That's lifestyle. her thing. I mean, if you can, if you can, if you can keep a person with dementia somehow in the range of kindness and positive emotions, um, you know, there's something to be said. There's a whole positive psychology of dementia care, and um, and that's, that's what we need to focus on because, <clears throat> frankly, it's a very complicated disease. Maybe someday someone will come up with a pharmacological problem, but in the meanwhile, uh, or solution, but in the meanwhile, um, you know, we, we, we have to engage the whole human self and the whole world around them and all of these ways of tapping into their continuing identity so that they can have a sense. By the way, you know, Dan Cohen with Music and Memory he did a really interesting study. You know, if, if you just do one of these interventions early in the day, you know, someone's listening to music they identify with from early on. For me, it would be, I want to hold your hand, the Beatles, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so it might not work a miracle. I mean, maybe they'll they'll get somatic and they'll, they'll be able to uh, respond to a few rightly posed questions. A lot of my book is about how to communicate effectively. But um, over the course of the day, they manage the world around them more peacefully. So there's a tremendous reduction in the need of uh, um, uh, antipsychotics and psychotraumatic type medications 
because somehow by getting into themselves through the music, they can they can manage with. Yeah, it's, it's what I'm hearing you say is though it's almost like it's it starts the engine. It sort of gets it puts the um, the cart on the track. It does. You yeah. Know, one of my students, Angela Lowe, who's now she, who's now graduated and did her residency, she's out practicing in Hawaii. We actually did a paper with Dan Cohen on swallowing and music and memory. And it turns out this was published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, which is, you know, a top flight journal that uh, the people who were um, having swallowing difficulties, and so they really relied heavily on assisted oral feeding and, and so forth. If you gave them personalized music as an intervention, even for you know 15 minutes, they would typically remember how to swallow. Huh. So they, it wasn't that they couldn't swallow, but they'd forgotten how to swallow and by stimulating them with music, so they get rhythmic and somatic, and you know, the, yeah, yeah. they actually remember not just you know maybe a bit of who they are, but they remember how to swallow. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, what I love most about this is that it's not on a prescription pad, or no. the prescription is non-pharmacological. You know, yeah, absolutely, and and so I, I I think that's where we need to need to go. And uh, but I'm, I'm I always hold hope. For a pharmacological intervention, but you got to realize that, you know, Peter, Peter and I flew on a Lilly neuroscience Learjet to Germany, and this is now 20 years ago to Markbreich, Germany, where Dr. Uh, Alzheimer lived, had his home, raised his family, and we spent four or five days with all the historians of Alzheimer's disease. Wow! And as it turns out, Alzheimer did not think he discovered a disease. He thought he had discovered a natural aspect of the aging brain. This is why if you want to do something to prevent this problem, get some exercise. <laughs> okay. The, I mean, the studies on walking are really pretty cool. I think the stuff that's come out of Colombia on, on diet, the Mediterranean diet, I think that's very good. Yeah. Basically, you know, and, and prosociality makes a difference and, and it, because it relieves stress. So walk with friends and eat a good meal to, yeah, to a Greek <laughs> restaurant to a Greek restaurant, and then on the way back, uh, maybe, you know, stop by the library or, you know, play a game of checkers or go to a jazz club or go to a jazz club. I mean, by the way, in New York, they've got the, the unforgettables choir, which comes out of NYU. And these are caregivers and their loved ones. And maybe the loved ones can't communicate much, but when they're singing, something that they both remember from years back in a choral environment, they get very stimulated and you have to be absolutely blind not to see the kind of effervescence that comes into the life of these deeply forgetful individuals. And they actually do a concert every month at St. Peter's Lutheran Church on, what is it, Lexington and, and uh, 50th Street. So I used to go to those because I thought it was so beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. We are out of time, which, you know, fear not, because you and I have to hang out more and record more. But I, I want to um, give our listeners your contact information to learn more about Dr. Stephen G. Post. Please visit StephenGPost.com, and that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N and then G post. On Twitter, you can find him at the same name, Stephen G. Post. We're talking about dignity for deeply forgetful people, how caregivers can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease. Stephen, come back because there's so much more to explore. Well, it's great exploring it with you, Lisa, because you've got a great style and I love the tone of your voice. So I couldn't be happier to come back. Just Aww. let me know. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Stephen G. Post, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, 
or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.